Hi there. Thank you so much for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, if you could pop in the chat your name, say hello and where you're from. That's always a, a really lovely way, I think, for us to kind of kick off and start off, see, see where this talk today is, is reaching to. Um, so welcome. So this talk is brought to you, uh, obviously, for the Agile Reflex Festival and in collaboration with the Agile Business Consortium. So we are the professional body for business agility and our mission is to advance business agility worldwide. Um, and today we've got a session um, with Ian Carroll, um, who's going to be talking about dependency management hacks to improve flow efficiency. Um, and Ian is a coach, trainer and speaker on all things kind of Kanban and agile software development related. So we're really pleased to have you here, Ian. Thank you so much for your time. Um, before I hand over to Ian to start his presentation and um, just a few little housekeeping rules from me. Um, if I could ask you guys to keep yourself on mute whilst Ian's going through his presentation, that would be brilliant. Um, also to make you aware that we are recording the session and that's purely uh, the people that haven't been able to make the live session. So then you guys can go back and access it either on the Agile Reflect 20 website in their archive or on the Agile Business Consortium website where we'll be keeping a lot of these as well. Um, if I could ask if you have any questions Ian throughout, if you could pop them in the chat because we'll have some time at the end to go through them, read them out, and Ian will be able to answer as many of them for you as possible. Um, and also just to make you aware that we'll be sending a little feedback link in the chat at the end, um, because we're doing a few more of these sessions uh, throughout the festival. So it'd be really helpful just to uh, hear how you've experienced the session and if you think there's anything we can improve on. Uh, so that's everything from me. I'm gonna stop chatting um, and I'm gonna hand over to Ian. So thanks very much, Ian. Thank you very much for that wonderful uh, introduction. Right, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Carroll. Um, what, what I would suggest as well is if people want to connect to me on LinkedIn, I'm a bit of a LinkedIn junkie, so feel free. Um, I pretty much accept all LinkedIn invites. Um, so 17 dependency management hacks to improve flow efficiency kind of rolls off the tongue that one doesn't it so um this is really a collection of different practices and techniques that i've basically come across uh, some of them we've evolved ourselves um they're going to be <clears throat> i guess um it's probably over the last 10 to 15 years I've been building this slide deck uh, and just actually earlier this week I was in the shower one morning and I thought of another dependency management hack and I've just not had time to stick it in the slide deck yet so yeah it's interesting how these things evolve and and we, we discover these things through going to the Gemba by going to where the work is actually done because that's where the excitement is and that's where we, we can really start to experiment and find out what works for us. So uh, before we get into the 17 dependency management hacks though, what we need to do is I need to maybe, uh, because there's a real mixed audience here probably, different levels, uh, what I'm gonna do is just introduce some base concepts which will set us up then for hopefully understanding the uh, dependency management hacks a little bit more. And one of the things that I uh, specialize in is Kanban as a, um, um, a, a certified, um, what is it, a accredited Kanban trainer. I'll try and get that out. And uh, so it's something that I do specially. There's probably a big theme of Kanban throughout this. Um, but don't worry, um, it's, it's fairly agnostic as in terms of methodologies. Okay, so base concepts. So the first thing is we've got to try and understand what problem are we trying to solve um, in terms of dependency management. And it's not just about dependency management. So we need to understand this idea of one of the base concepts is cycle time. So how predictable are we as a team? And there's a number of things that can affect our predictability and we can measure predictability in terms of our cycle time. So what cycle time? 
So if you imagine for every work item that moves across your delivery stream, so your Scrum board or Kanban board or whatever board you've got, um, each item takes a certain amount of time to get across that board. And of course, not everything is equal. So for example, we have a ticket and it sits in the backlog for, could be any amount of time, couldn't it? Whether that's a product backlog, sprint backlog, it sits there. It's only at the point where it passes what we call the commitment point. You've started work on that item. That's the point in which we start the stopwatch going. And it moves across our value stream through dev, test, whatever other steps until it meets our definition of done. And at that point, we press stop on the, on the, on the timer. <clears throat> and of course, not every ticket takes the same amount of time to go across the board. Even if your story point sizing, um, you know, a one point doesn't go through always at the same rate as other one point stories, we get variation in our cycle time. So in this graph here, we can see, um, you know, this item, can you see me wafting by the way, hopefully? Great. So I'm wafting my mouse pointer. So that item took 11 days. This was seven, five, six, nine. So using standard deviation, we can work out what are the expected predictable boundaries of this data set. Now, this is a very predictable team. Um, so they should be able to deliver any work item somewhere between six and say 14 days. But of course there is an outlier. There's something that took 19 days. So the team should be really using this as a diagnostic tool because that 19 day work item could uh, give them some insight as to what's causing their, them to become unpredictable. <clears throat> so that, that's, that's one way in which we can kind of visualize and, and, and render our um, cycle time out. There is another method, which is looking at our cycle time as a, um, as a distribution in a histogram. And so what we can see here is 85% of our work items were delivered in 15 days or less. We also then, if, if people say, well, can you be a bit more confident in, in, in your predictions? We say, well, if we want to be 95% confident, 95% of our cycle time data points um, took 23 days. Okay. Now what you'll see is different teams have different distributions here. And the further out to the right this goes, the longer and fatter that tail is, we call it the tail, um, the less predictable the team is, is likely to be. All right. And one of the techniques we use quite often is called trimming the tail. So we'll look at what are our sources of, dis, of, sources of uh, variation, which are affecting our predictability. Okay. And this is a great exercise in retrospectives as well. You know, start to attack your sources of variation. Now though, what are the common sources of variation? Well, I've got a little shooting range here. So let's look at some of the common ones. Poor technical environments, technical debt. Maybe the team are working with unfamiliar tools. Maybe there's waiting time being incurred around the board. Uh, too much work in progress, trying to do too much at once. Everything's a priority. So there's a whole bunch of things here that could affect the team's ability to be predictable. Now, in today's talk, we're really going to focus in on the dependencies. So this is when we have to hand off to other teams. So that, that's the first concept around cycle time. And, and if you think about why dependency management is important, it's because it's dependencies. Dependencies will, will cr create um, less predictable outcomes for the team. All right. So we need to kind of tackle that and, and see what we can do about it. Now, the next concept is what do we mean by a dependency? So I've been dragged into on a different client sites, different projects. I've been, I've been dragged into dependency management meetings. And the first question I always ask is, what do you mean by a dependency? And the reason I ask that question is because of a really great little white paper. And it's entitled The Taxonomy of Agile Software Project Dependencies. And that was written in 2012 by Strode and Huff. So I'd recommend that you go and have a look at that. And it categorizes 
dependencies in, in quite a useful way. So it's not just a task dependency. We can have um, skilled uh, skills dependencies. So, you know, maybe you've got somebody, uh, a shared resource, or a shared person across the, across the organization. They do use the word resource. And I know in the agile community, we shouldn't refer to people as resources. So, uh, but again, that, that is something that, that is mentioned in there. But that aside, it's still a really useful way to um, understand our dependencies. Um, so we're not going to spend too much time on this because you can go and read about that. I'm just going to signpost you to, to that, that kind of um, body of knowledge there. Right. The next thing about dependencies is what do we mean by a team? So let's imagine we've got a feature team and this is a cross-functional team because in the agile community, that's what we advocate. That's what we really encourage. Um, this is a very scrummy team. So they've got scrum masters, product owner, dev testers, etc. cetera. Um, but they still find that they have handoffs. They still are dependent on other teams. Now the picture I'm gonna paint now is a real scenario from mid last year uh, with one particular client. So they had um, feature teams. They also had then component teams as well. So some examples of components, uh, they had a firmware, like, um, you know, they were quite a hardware related business. They had uh, some legacy mainframe. They had Microsoft Dynamics, SAP. They had an API team who kind of glued a lot of this stuff together and plugged it all together. Um, so if you think about trying to create a cross-functional team with all of those people in it, it'd be, it'd be quite difficult. They also had then shared service teams. So as work was passing through their board, you would have legal who had to get involved. We had um, user researchers and user experience because um, they were always in demand, but there was very few of them. They were shared across lots of different teams. I'm sure we've all been in this situation before. And what's interesting, I'm gonna, I'm, this is warts and all this, this talk. Um, I could talk about, well, this is how we should do it and the, the proper way to do it. But unfortunately we find ourselves in these situations out in the wild and in real organizations, okay? Um, whether it's right or wrong, there's a bunch of strategies in here that'll help you business intelligence, IT operations. Um, so this feature team, the yellow team there, was, was handing off to all these different teams at some point on their journey, as well as other feature teams. So it's a very complex environment. And if you imagine we took people from each of these teams and merged them down into a, a full cross-functional team, it, it would be, it, it would be, Maybe productive for that team, if you could kind of onboard and quick enough and get the interactions right. But also you've just taken some people, some capacity out of the other teams who have their own customers. So I know we talk a lot in the community about don't manage dependencies, break them instead. You know, we should break them. It's not always possible or desirable as well. Um, so we, we're going to explore that a little bit. So that's, that's teams. So we've done cycle time. We've done teams. Next, we're going to talk about upstream versus downstream dependencies. So what I'd like you to imagine now is the feature team at the top there, they have a ticket, it gets blocked. So they're operating Kanban. They put a blocker sticker on it. They hand off to the shared service team but it doesn't go straight into their in progress column. It goes into their backlog and it's waiting to be prioritized. The team start working on it. It then gets blocked again because they have to hand off to a component team. Um, eventually that component team pick up the piece of work. They play the card through their board, which unblocks this ticket. They then work that ticket through their board, which unblocks it again. And finally, this team is able then to deliver. So we got three levels of, of dependencies there. Uh, and quite often we find many levels of dependencies. Um, so a couple of rules that we, we try to, to encourage here um, is first of all, if you're upstream and you're looking downstream, 
you want to be confident that each of the teams you're dependent on has a short tail on their cycle time histogram. Because remember, the longer that tail, the less predictable they're going to be. So it could sit in their backlog for an awful lot, long time uh, and then get blocked and get handed off, et cetera. So you want to understand what, what is happening downstream. So the one lowest here has got the shortest um, cycle time histogram. So they're a lot more predictable. So you'd expect a pretty good response from them. Uh, the next part of this is um, downstream teams are often completely blind to the upstream dependency. To them, it's just more work arriving. Yeah, it's quite hard to see upstream to see the real kind of magnitude of, of what's happening there. Um, the team furthest upstream owns the entire dependency chain because they're the only ones who can really have that visibility downstream of what's going on. So that's, that's quite an interesting one. So what I'm talking about there, if you look, that, that's downstream, obviously, and that's upstream in terms of what, what I'm talking about. By the way, I'm looking off to the right here because I've got I've got some little nice faces on, on the screen there, which is uh, it's nice to see faces. So that's great. Okay. Um, of course, there's dependencies everywhere. So when you have a work item coming to your backlog, maybe there's a technical design authority has to sign things off. Maybe you hand off to an API team. Maybe that team hands off to an SAP team and a CRM team. Then it gets to some demo and we have to get legal sign off before we can get it into our live environment. Uh, but of course, then we've got IT operations in the way and to get anything shipped alive, you know, we don't all, we all don't all live in this, this nice shiny DevOps world yet. Maybe you have to hand off to a release team, to a DBA team and to a firewall team. So you can see there's a big chain of dependencies there. Um, thing to remember, is your organization is a network of interconnected services. So this, this idea of creating the perfect cross-functional team, uh, it, what, what, it, what is a perfect cross-functional team? What is the ideal organizational blueprint? Yeah, do we, do we organize our teams by um, front-end team, middleware, back-end by layers of our architecture? Do we organize them by customer journey, by specialisms? There, there could be a whole bunch of different ways to do that and you'll never find the, the perfect fit. So again, we have to, we have to realize that, you know, in, in most sort of medium to large scale organizations, dependencies are, 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 are here to stay. Okay. So there's generally two approaches that you could use to managing dependencies. The first one is break the dependency. Fantastic. That, that would be ideal. Um, I would strongly recommend and encourage people to pursue breaking dependencies where you can. But it's, it's hard. It's difficult because often breaking dependencies means re-architecting your organization, not just from a technical perspective, but also from a team structure. You know, Conway's law, that's starting to creep in now. Um, if you start breaking teams up, we've got them politics, which, which are at play. People are maybe building their empire um, in particular areas of the business. You're then saying, no, we're going to break up your empire and we're going to redistribute it because we want cross-functional teams. Um, maybe you've got a monolithic architecture. Again, coming back to Conway's law, which is stopping you from really being able to break the dependency. And of course, legacy technology. With legacies all around us, right? So that that's the first pro approach you could maybe um, use. The second one is to reduce the impact of the dependency on your flow. All right. So what we're now going to do, I'm going to take you through 17 dependency management hacks or practices. I use hacks because it's it's a bit of clickbait in a way, isn't it? It sounds a bit cool, hacks. But uh, anyway, these, these are practices that we've kind of built up. As I say, you, you wouldn't bring them all out and throw them all at a dependency problem. Uh, they're all kind of geared towards different situations that you may find yourself in. Okay, bear with me. Right. 
as I say, these are in no particular order. And I'm going to be um, as um, unbiased and, and, and kind of straight down the line as, as possible with some of this. Right, number one, planning and scheduling. Have I really just pulled out a Gantt chart in a, at an Agile conference? Shoot me now. So let, let's, let's explore it though, yeah? Let's, so, it, sorry, in, in the bottom left of, of each of these slides, you'll see the word reduce or break. So what I'm trying to say here is this strategy was, will probably help you to reduce or it might help you to break the, the dependency. So this first one, planning and scheduling. Um, I still see these Gantt charts pulled out regularly across client sites. Um, I, I guess there's, there's a few challenges that come with these Gantt charts. The first one is um, this tends to be too many meetings associated with producing these Gantt charts uh, because there's so much maintenance involved in creating them. And the, the premise in which these are normally based on is we're going to be able to forecast in the future when we're going to require a particular team to do some work for us. So surely if we just book that time with that team in the future, then we can produce this chart, we can link it all together and what could possibly go wrong? Okay. Now, if anyone's familiar with uh, the gaming and the betting scene the, uh, in the UK, we, we have something called an accumulator bet. <clears throat> and basically you, you string together a series of bets and the odds roll and accumulate from bet to bet. So you could put say a dollar or a pound on a bet and turn that into a hundred thousand, uh, whatever. Um, the odds of doing that though are incredibly, you know, tight it's really hard to, to kind of come up with that so actually using this technique i'm equating that to a an accumulator bet you're you're really hoping that each of these teams are going to deliver exactly when you think they're going to deliver so then all your plan sticks together so i guess from a dependency management perspective it's possibly the worst approach you could take but you yeah is there value in it Probably a little bit. Yeah, if, if that's all you've got, then fine, use that. Okay, <clears throat> got that one out of the way. Right, next one, number two, the program board. This was popularized by uh, SAFE, Scaled Agile Framework. And the idea here is that we simply lay out our sprints or our releases or our iterations um, in a matrix across them with the teams that are going to deliver it. We then take our features or our epics or our stories, whatever level that you're planning at, and we lay them out. And we then use bits of wool or string in a physical world, and we link all these together, and it creates as a nice kind of dependency um, kind of map. Um, I really like this approach, particularly when you see the collaboration that happens when you've got loads of stakeholders all coming together, really understanding the impacts of, of the dependencies. Um, and, it, and it's a really good session. I guess some of the the, the not so great aspects of this is it's, it can be quite hideous to keep up to date. As the delivery, as the program moves on, and you see some of these work items not getting delivered in that iteration as planned for, for whatever reasons they roll over they get they get moved to the next iteration you end up with this kind of rolling bow wave of of stuff building up and moving across the board sometimes and of course maintaining that can be a little bit of a bit of a headache so yeah i, I, I like this approach this there's, there's some there's some really great visualization in there great collaboration that, that it kind of drives and you can do this dead easily in Miro or Mural. Now we're all uh, remote. So yeah, again, pretty good. I like that. Oh, the other thing is there's an assumption here. You can kind of, you know, you, you know your kind of dependencies up front. And even as you move through the program and discover more dependencies, the challenge then is actually um, trying to incorporate them into the map if it's an ever-changing map. So that, that's why it's quite hideous to kind of keep up to date. Right, number three, this is an absolute corker. Uh, this, this, for me, is something we really drive a lot of teams to do. And this is this idea that we just visualize blockers 
And what we used to do is once we'd unblocked a piece of work, we used to take the blocker sticker off of it and throw it in the bin. Uh, but now what we do is we keep them. And what we do is we see what we can learn from that. We cluster them. So this is, um, this, these images are used with kind permission from Klaus Leopold and Troy McGuinness. And this one here on the left, you take your blocker stickers once we've, once we've unblocked and we cluster them. So internal, external, maybe the ones towards the bottom are when it was a short amount of time to unblock. So the days here say, how, how long was it blocked for? And you've got some big ticket items in the top left there. Um, and you just see what you learn from this. So we, we, we collect data and we then take that into our retrospectives. There's also another grid here. This is a grid approach. So in the X axis, this is talking about um, when we have a blocker, what is the delay time? What is the impact of when it happens? How long is it blocked for? And in the Y axis, we've then got, well, how often do we get blocked on it? What's the frequency of this reoccurring? And what's cool, and you can look at these quadrants. And for anything that appears in the, in the top right quadrant, um, you can either move it left and reduce the, the delay time, or you can move it down to redu remove, uh, reduce the frequency of it happening and find ways of, of doing that. Okay, don't try and go diagonally across. It's really hard. You, you do one and then the other. Okay. Next one is reduce systemic work in progress. So I do a lot of work with portfolio Kanban, uh, taking organizations uh, portfolios and visualizing them. And if the green tickets there on the portfolio board represent, let's say projects, you know, another swear word for the agile community, but anyway, they're projects and they hand them out, they distribute them across the teams on the right. And of course the projects normally explode into hundreds of um, tickets. So what we can see here is team one have got one, two, three, four, five, six projects in progress. So actually there's some portfolio steps that can be taken to take the teams from this view to this view. So we can, we can cut it off at its source upstream. Um, so if anyone's got a kind of portfolio Kanban and, you know, maybe adopt this idea of PIPs projects in progress, if, if you, if you use projects. Uh, and reducing the amount of projects you have in progress. And that's a great way to break the dependency because what you find is the more work you have in progress, the more dependencies you're going to have. Uh, and of course, then the important thing is then about how we sequence the work through the teams in order to uh, kind of optimize our um, reduction in dependencies. You have to monitor and reduce your systemic waiting time. So when a team hands off to another team, as I said before, they, they just, they're not sat there with nothing to do, waiting for you to just give them some work. They're often busy with their own priorities. So if you can start to measure what is the lead time of getting work into other teams, what, it's interesting, what, what's that phrase? What, what gets measured gets improved. So we can then start to um, hopefully find ways to expedite some of these work items. And again, collecting data using the cycle time histograms um, to give you some insight as, as to what's happening across the organization. Develop a self-serve capability. So why hand off? Why not do the work yourself and I, th I think what was really great about this was the whole DevOps movement. I remember um, phases where you would have a team who would say, right, we're going to move to a DevOps model. Right, let's get a DevOps person in. Let's sit them in the team and let's give that person all the DevOps work. And it's like, mm, it's not really fixing the problem there. What we need is we need the, um, what we need is the, the DevOps person creating capabilities for the team to self-serve. So they reduce that handoff. Okay, so it's this same concept. The next one is systemic swarming. So I had a, um, another recent example where team A were dependent on team B doing some work for them. Um, the individual was called Corey, he's a nice guy. He, he basically said, it's really frustrating because I know what I've got to do. 
Um, but because I'm in a separate team, I'm seen as not being allowed to kind of work on that. So we suggested, well, why don't you go and join that team for a, a period of time, however long that takes. You work through their board, move the card through their board with them. You could even pair with them if, if, if you need to. Um, but ultimately, it's about moving the people to the work where it needs to be done. And Corey went and joined that team. He respected their release cadence and their daily stand-ups, all the rest of that. He worked with them to deliver that feature before then returning back to his own team to um, actually, you know, continue with his normal work. And in some organizations, that's quite a tough one because if you've got somebody who's maybe a bit of an empire builder and I've heard the phrase in the past, oh no, well, you can't go and work for that team because you work for my team. And if you do work for that team, what if I lose you? What if you don't come back? So there's this kind of, in, in some organizations, you, you, you've got to be quite careful of that. The next one, pull requests. So uh, this is the idea, again, playing on that idea from the last one, that in some organizations, the source repositories are all locked down by team. So other teams do not have access to um, another team's source code. Um, because they like to um, enforce that kind of separation. And um, it's quite an interesting one, really. I, I prefer a more kind of open source approach um, where if you want to work on another team's code base, by all means do it, but make sure we've got some guide rails in there. In other words, pull requests. So you can't just go in there and change things. You submit your pull requests. And if it gets approved and reviewed and approved, then it gets merged in with uh, with that team's code base. So you kind of, it's a kind of self-serve model mixed in there, but it's more of a specific technique. I'm hoping this is quite a common thing that everyone or most teams are using at the moment. Um, but of course, it depends on the platform and the technology. Next one. Um, if you're going to hand off because you need, say, a team to, I don't know, produce um, an API for you, well, you could always mock it out or, or stub it uh, yourself to enable you to continue because then it means you're, you're able to then continue with your feedback loops with your stakeholders, building capabilities. Uh, but of course, there is a bit of a challenge there where, you know, you still got to come back at some point, plug it into the real interface and test it as well. So you've got all that testing effort. So it's just something to think about there. Next one, number 10. We have got queue and wait. So I've worked quite extensively with uh, price comparison websites. So um, I know we've got quite an international community here So um, on this call. So the idea here is if I want to insure my vehicle, my car, um, I go to an insurance company. But of course, there's lots to pick from. So I go to a price comparison website. I put in my details about my car. I hit the get quote button. The price comparison website sends that request out to hundreds of insurance companies and then gets all of their prices back and then presents it. So the aggregate insurance quotes, basically. It's pretty amazing, actually, that, that how quick it does. It is milliseconds in, in most cases. Um, but, they, but this is the team, the board you can see in the screen here is the team who did the integrations with the hundreds of insurance companies. And what would happen was they would have a ticket come across the board. The team would stick a blocker sticker on it and say, oh, we block now because we're waiting for such and such an insurance company to do their bit of integration work. Um, well, we're doing Kanban as well. So how does this work? Because we're going to just get blocked all the time. We're going to blow all our limits and, oh, bit of a nightmare. So what we did was we created a third party handoff um, area down here. So instead of blocking the work up here and taking capacity, a slot of the Kanban board, we would hand the work off because guess what? That represents the flow of the work. We would put it in the third party whip column under dev work in progress. When we get notification from the insurance company that we are now ready to pick up that work and they've done their bit, we move it backwards into this done area here. Now, when a developer comes available because they finished their work and they've got capacity, they now pull from this entire column here, all that they look all the way down with a preference of hopefully 
down here in the bottom left, okay? So that's where they pull from. And of course, they can go round and round that loop quite a few times, we found. Um, and of course, we had a similar thing replicated for testing as well, because it, it was really com complex, the, the, their approach to testing. So yeah, that's one way. So you can kind of queue and wait and, and hand off to third parties there. A third party could be another team internally. Uh, you know, there's different ways of looking at that. Backlog visualization, number 11. So this is where we simply, uh, quite often what happens, teams will pull work in, they'll start working on it, and then they'll go, oh, we've got a dependency. Uh, we, with a bit of hindsight now, we, we should have really known about that. So using icons or some sort of description, maybe checkboxes on the cards in the backlog to show you what, what dependencies need to be resolved before you pull that into your kind of pipeline, start working on it. All right. Here's probably the most common, easiest one that I find happening a lot is managing both ends of the... So we've got team A here. They've got a, a piece of work that's dependent on team B. So team B have to complete their work first. And we say, we can't pull this in because it, it, we, we haven't resolved that dependency. So my question is always, well, can we look at team B's board and find this piece of work that you need to do? So we head over to team B, we look at their board and, oh, where's that golden ticket? It's not on there. Have you spoke to this team? Well, I sent them an email. Uh, okay, well, let's come and look at their board. Let's make sure the work you need doing is actually on their board. And let's have conversations with whoever's making that selection decision, whether it's a product owner or some sort of delivery person involved in that. Um, but also, let's then attend their daily stand-ups and make sure our work is flowing across their board um, it, as, as we need it to. Remember trimming the tail? Well, let, let's make sure we, we still... And don't forget, if you're upstream, you manage the downstream dependencies. So it's your responsibility to go to those downstream boards and, and kind of bring all that together to make sure it flows. Here's another common one we see, uh, just a simple dependency map, um, about who's dependent on who. Uh, what I like about this one as well is, um, you often see it in the kind of scrum of scrums, if anyone's using that. Um, you can color code them to say it's urgent or it's kind of, it's, it's imminent or it's maybe we're okay for a few days yet. So getting that kind of time element, that dimension on there is also quite useful. The next one, number 14. All right. So this is a bit like, remember we talked about trimming the tail and when you hand off to another team, it could sit in their backlog for any amount of time, depending on their priorities. Uh, it might get lost in their backlog, particularly in JIRA as well, when it disappears down the list. Um, so this, what we're trying to depict here, it's a bit like at Disneyland or at Alton Towers where you have a fast track pass, a fast pass where you, you, you don't get immediately onto the ride, but you get to the front of the queue immediately. All right, so in this world, we're saying that anything that arrives in this inbound upstream dependencies, bit of a dodgy title, that, but anything that lands in this box down here, we should immediately have a conversation with the product owner to say, should we pull that in or not? It, it doesn't guarantee you it will get pulled. You've still got to justify the value for, for, for doing that. You've still got to put a good case forward for doing it um, as to why it's more important than everything else in their demand. But again, it, it's quite a useful way of, of, of being able to do that. Um, don't, don't try this with shared service teams or because they have many masters Okay, they're a dependency for everyone generally. So, yeah, just use this for maybe your shared, um, your feature teams. If you've got a feature team dependent on another feature team. Next one, uh, re-architect. Don't manage your dependencies. You've got to break them. Uh, and again, you know, some of the um, some some of the way that teams are arranged are, are closely linked to the architecture of the underlying platform that you're working on. So again, one of the dependence, one of the approaches is to re-architect and re-platform. And I've seen a number of organizations do this. And in all those cases that I've seen, it's taken them years, not months, to, to, to do that pivot to change the architecture. Okay. 
Oh, this is an interesting one. Um, this is the idea that um, people are sharing maybe uh, the common one is a test environment. And if you want to use the test environment, it's a bit like a deli counter. You've got to take a ticket and wait till your number's called and then you can put your, your wares into, into the test environment. Um, and again, this is about, you know, using cloud, using DevOps, all our kind of modern kind of practices, uh, kind of um, resources that are available to us to reduce that contention and, and remove it completely. And again, this is a way to break the, the, the dependencies, but of course, it, it quite often it can be quite longer term. And actually some platforms are still not in the cloud, you know, particularly some of the mainframe stuff. Um, actually, no, well, the mainframe stuff is in the cloud, but there's certain platforms with customers where I've seen that, you know, they just can't um, put things in the cloud. And then the final one is this idea of merge hell. So some teams have really complicated and unnecessarily complicated branching strategies. And suddenly when they come to merge and release, it's like, well, who's going to go first? And uh, so one of the techniques that is out there is something called feature toggles. So you essentially, um, it's trunk-based development and you're decoupling your code release from the feature enablement in that you can kind of release essentially unfinished code, but it's switched off. All right. So key takeaways, or to make sure we've got plenty of time for questions. First of all, visualize every way you can your dependencies and you, and measure, measure as much as you can. Uh, you, you would have thought to a certain extent, the measurement bit gets easier. Now we're all remote and we're forced to use tools. But what we find is the tooling is not, fit for purpose for, for, for tackling this. So I spend a lot of time with clients in Python, extracting data from Jira or Azure DevOps uh, using through their APIs, um, just so we can get the right data. And then whatever you do find is, is you, you then got to optimize, you've got to constantly look at the data that you're getting and constantly change um, your maybe your, your approaches and dip in and out of the different techniques that we've that we've kind of covered here. Now, what I'd be really keen to to hear from people as well. I'm sure you've you've got lots of questions. It looks like in the chat window, yeah, plenty of questions. That's good. Um, but also, if anyone would want to share some maybe some of the dependency management hacks that they've come across as well, that would be really useful. So, thank you. Um, the link at the bottom there is a blog article which has got all of these slides from this presentation in it. So feel free to go there, um, have a read through, comment, and, um, and again, if you'd like to connect on LinkedIn, more than happy to do so. Okay, question time. Yeah, thank you, Ian. That's um, and thank you for sharing that link as well. That's really helpful for the, the slide deck. Um, we have had a few questions in, so do you mind if I start shooting them your way, and you can we Go can make it. a start on them? How, how do you um, want to do it? Do you want the person <laughs> who who asked the question give them the option to come in on on the microphone and ask it? Maybe so. Sure. Yeah. So I'll read out um the name. Um, so first one I saw come through was from Curtis, Curtis Palmer. Do you want to ask your question, Curtis? Oh, we can't, can't quite hear you, Curtis. I'm sorry. Too, too many different microphones, too many different setups. Um, I asked a couple of questions. Which one are you referring to? I can go back and. Um, I see your one about hack ten, but feel free to ask oh, away, okay. whatever yep. question you prefer. <laughs> so, in hack number ten, you looped back the third party queue, and my question was, was kind of, you know, how do you, how do you, how are you able to accomplish something like that with uh, just ALM tools? You mentioned we're remote. Loved having a, a built a wall. You know everything. Uh, visualizing everything, 
anticipating everything and recognizing you can't anticipate everything, of course, is kind of the thread that goes through your whole presentation. But um, this was intriguing. But but how do I how do I do that? How do I execute something like that in uh, rally, for instance? Or, yeah, yeah. Uh, ooh, I, you know what? It's interesting. I, I, I've delivered this talk a number of times now, and and it all keeps coming back to tooling. Um, and you know the visualization you can see there was was pre COVID. Yeah, we're all in the same office. We can stick things on walls and. Uh, and of course, back then there was always the argument of, oh, why are we why are we using Post-it notes as well as Jira? It's like duplication. We have to do both, and oh, can't we just do it in Jira? But of course, <clears> we lose this visualization side of it. Uh, so that was an ongoing battle. Uh, but of course, we the, the team got real value from visualizing it on a on a physical wall. Now, post COVID, what have we got? Miro, Mural. These are some of the tools that teams use. And we've still got those same arguments. Why are we updating it in Miro when it's in Jira or Rally or whatever else? So again, I guess there's a there's a there's an ask for the tool vendors really is how do we get out of our prison bar approach to to delivery and how can we get a bit more creative and have more features to really construct these boards that truly represent our workflows rather than it's a bit i always say it's a bit like the jira tail is wagging the dog in most cases so if that makes sense so we you know we, we constrained by the tools and they are very limiting but you're right it is a, it is a it is a challenge and uh, i think the best way i've come across it so far is visualize it in mirror mirror or mural um or pick a tool that might give you more flexibility so in the, in the, yeah, I, I love, I totally, you know, plus one on everything there uh, because the tool kind of drives our uh, behavior. And when the tool doesn't let us do something that's innovative, like you're proposing here, I'm just, I, I just, I want to like overcome that somehow. So, but I, but I love the idea because it just, um, I work in the SAP world with Agile, just with SAP systems, and the dependencies are are through the roof. Just just them. So I see something like this, I'm like, man, that that would that would trigger a conversation. I'll, you know, allow wait for master data to do their job. You know, you know, feed it back into the system, et cetera. Um, yeah. Well, actually, we, you and I need to talk then because the uh, I do a lot of work with SAP clients as well. And it's all the specialisms around the different modules and, and the release. It's so hard to, you know, it's complicated release um, approaches. So, yeah, yeah, let, let's, okay. I'll let's reach out. exchange uh, tips on that. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you. Yeah, we've got a few come, come through. So the next one um, after Curtis's was from uh, Maru. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Apologies if I haven't. Um, and they wanted to ask about number 12. So, Maru, I don't know if you want to jump on the mic. I'm sorry, it was, I think it was number, what is this? I don't remember which one I didn't get. It was either number 11 or 12. Uh, maybe this one. Yeah, you, you, you've written here, yeah, understanding number 12. Um, yep. And just for another summary. Okay. Yeah, so I, I guess the, the summary here is, you have to manage both ends of the dependency. So if, if I'm handing off to another team, it's my responsibility to make sure that that team are actually dealing with my request appropriately. Because well, the common thing that I see is when we hand off, imagine this golden ticket on the screen now is the one we want to hand off. When I go to the other team's board, I can't find my request on their board anywhere. Um, and it's only when I then explore a bit further that I realized there's been some form of breakdown of communication and we put it on their board and then it's my responsibility, excuse me, to also manage it, help keep an eye on it going across their board. So if it does get stuck or it does get blocked, I can hopefully find a way to escalate that and, and get it unblocked and get it moved across the board. Sorry, Ian, it was number 13. 13? <laughs> yes. There we go. Right. Um, yeah. So, so this this is essentially, if you imagine, team one can't be dependent on itself, but it can be dependent on team two or team three or team four. 
And what you then do is each of these tickets on here represents a dependency or a piece of work that needs to be done. And you then say, so team three required team one to produce this piece of work here. Um, and we need it within oh, the next five days or else it's really going to start impacting our timeline. Uh, team one is dependent on team four, but that's really urgent. We really need to get this resolved as a, again, I often see this board design in a kind of scrum of scrum setting. Okay. It's very, very useful. I would have uh, understood it as a priority um, map. So red would be, um, this is uh, highly critical for us. Maybe, maybe it can take a week, but um, if this is not well done, this is going to crash all our efforts. But I guess that's a different view. Yeah. Um, cool. I wanted to share with you one strategy we use in, compl uh, in complexity or dependency reduction. So we use something called abstractionism. But what we do is instead of slicing work vertically, we slice it in some cases horizontally. That means we set up teams that can do something at a higher abstraction level in terms of functionality building. So for example, architecturally wise or something around governance or security or even functionality wise. And then we, we give a different team that has then um, because of this uh, horizontal slicing, less dependencies on other teams, the power over um, um, a sub, um, let's say a more concrete piece of work. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. 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 It's interesting because I, I think, I think that one in particular is, 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 could be quite prickly, particularly with this audience, because we always talk about vertically slicing stories and functionality. But you're right. You know what? You, sometimes you have to split that out. That's if that's if that's the way it works in your organisation. Yeah. So you got that kind of split and combine pattern, isn't it? That's that's what that is. Cool. Thank you very much, Maru, for your question. Um, I hope you guys don't mind. I'm going to re read out the questions um, from here on in, just because I'm aware of getting through through them and and wanting everyone to get their questions um, asked. So the next one was from Neil. Uh, thank you, Neil, for your question. He said, what was the extra, um, oh, sorry, that was your second question. I'm on the wrong question for you. He said, what was the extra hack you thought of in the shower this morning? <laughs> right, well, so if you think about when, we sh when we're sequencing tasks and all the rest of that, um, this isn't my hack, by the way, it just, it was some of that came back. One of the, the common things that we have is when we're dependent on a particular person in the organisation, or a set of skills within the organization. And um, they're always in short supply and, and you, you kind of, it's hard to kind of get their time to come and work with your team to help you. Um, and there's, there's this thing called staff liquidity, which is um, a, an approach developed by Chris Matz. And it's actually, it turns it on its head a little bit. Instead of saying who are we dependent on, it says, what are the capabilities do we have within the team and how confident are we? So if, if, you're, if your team um, develops and supports a particular feature or a particular product, you've then got to look at it and assess, well, can everybody in the team have, we, if, if we look at the key capabilities required to deliver that feature, have we got everything we need in the team? And, and actually, do we have any weak spots in the team? Can everybody support everything? Uh, do we have enough liquidity in the team in terms of skills to deliver that capability? So it's it's a hat tip to Chris Matz, really. For for if you if you search for Chris Matz staff liquidity, you'll see some great um, uh, talks about that. He's also got a spreadsheet which you can kind of a template you can use and and assess your own team to see where your risks are in terms of capabilities. Um, so yeah, and then of course when you've identified the gaps and the, and the risks you can work towards then filling those gaps, which may take time, but yeah. Awesome, thank you, Ian. And thank you, Neil, for the question. Um, the next question we've had is from Daniel. So thank you, Daniel. He said, what is Conway's law? Ah, so let's go to um, easiest way to describe it. All right. So first of all, go and Google it. You see a quick description, cheap, cheap answer. But the other thing, way to look at it is you can see teams. So each of these, where I'm wafting, let's say these blocks stuck together. This represents one team. 
They're a, a full stack team. They've got front end, they've got middleware, and they've got data capabilities. And they can d deliver value to, um, to a production environment independent of other teams. Now, um, you may then decide that actually, well, some organizations may say, well, we've got a um, three front end teams. We've got one collective middleware team and we've got three separate data teams for, for you know, simplicity. But of course you can have lots of different configurations of these. And often what we find is the, um, that the way the, the teams are organized often reflects the architecture of the underlying system. If that makes sense. So again, Conway's law is Melvin Conway. I think in the was it the fifties or sixties, maybe, maybe even later than that. Anyway, he he basically came up with this thing where he said the the uh, communication paths within an organisation uh, will often be reflected in the in the architecture of the software develops. And the example he gives is if you de develop, uh, if you have four teams developing a compiler you will probably end up with a four pass compiler. All right. I'm not sure who develops compilers anymore these days, but I'm sure somebody else somewhere in the world. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that gives you an idea. You know, if it, once you start looking at Conway's law, it, it's a really fascinating area. Um, you get into organizational design and all sorts of challenges around that. Brilliant. Thank you, Ian. Uh, we have two more questions and then we'll round up. So the first one is um, from two. I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. Um, they've said for Hack 12, as an upstream team, what can my team do if the backlog of the downstream team is not visible to us? Politically, they don't want us to see it. Um, I, don't, I was going to switch back to the slide, but I don't think that's going to help. <clears throat> well, again, that isn't that another uh, isn't that a signal of another problem in the organisation that needs to be resolved? Maybe one thing you could do is you could you could create a virtual board for their team. In other words, a kind of pseudo board, which is basically to do, doing, and done. And so you can represent that you've handed off on a nice little diagram of your own start measuring how long it takes to get out of, through their team. Um, that might be one way that you could maybe then use as some sort of leverage to get visibility. Yeah, quite interesting. Thank you. No, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's a tough one, that, isn't it? <laughs> maybe you guys can connect on LinkedIn. And yeah, let's that, explore that one. That one out. Yeah. yeah. Um, and last one for the moment, if you have any more questions for Ian that I haven't got to, do, do connect with him because um, I think we're all just wanting to kind of pick your brains, Ian. But the last one um, here is from Doug. So thank you, Doug. He said, a common rule of Kanban is that cards do not move backwards. With the queue and wait pattern, how do you effectively capture the cycle time of the development workflow step? Yeah, I'd... I, I... I would suggest that cards move. Cards are not allowed to move backwards. Is a bit of a myth, really. I, I, there's no. I, I've not seen that in any of the uh, Kanban University training materials. However, cards do every now and again go backwards. Yeah, ideally we want it to be a one-way system and keep flowing towards the, the point of value. But what we should look at that as is a signal that there's something not quite right in our process, maybe or it may be an indicator that we need to look at some of it. Why is something going backwards? Um, and its impact on cycle time is unaffected really, because as long as it doesn't go all the way back into the backlog, you know, past our commitment point, uh, so that's when we start timing. All it's gonna do is lengthen our cycle time, our cycle time will increase, and we should be able to see that in our data and be able to then drill down on that. That should be the, the impact there. Uh, Hopefully that's that covers that one. Brilliant, thank you, Ian. Um, so if you have any more questions for Ian, you want to continue kind of picking his brains, do connect with him because I can see that this is um everyone's really enjoyed this session in the chat. They're all saying how valuable it's been, Ian, and thank you so much. So um just a huge thank you, really, for everyone joining today and participating in this session that uh, we brought from 
uh, from the consortium to the festival. Um, a huge thank you to Ian for your time and bringing all this information. I think that was a real kind of open and honest look at some of the hats and kind of how realistic some of those processes work in, in organisations. So thank you for that. Um, if you want to stay in touch with us, um, visit the agilebusiness.org where we've got some of the latest business agility news. And we're actually prepping for our uh, virtual conference in October and we're looking for speakers. So if you fancy being a speaker or you just want to participate, do get in touch. Um, and that's everything from us today. So a huge thank you again. And, um, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. Thanks so, for having me. Thanks so much, everyone.